Thank you everyone for joining this uh, event uh, co-sponsored by Knowledge Ecology International, Innovarte, and Medicines, Law and Policy. And um, we have three distinguished uh, uh, experts presenting, uh, Jamie Love, Ellen Tehoun, and uh, Luis Villarroel, who will be sharing their reflections and perspectives on um, some of the technology transfer and intellectual property uh, uh, provisions of the current uh, pandemic treaty text. And this also includes know-how. And without further ado, um, I would like to uh, give the floor over to Jamie. Jamie, you have the floor. I guess I'll be the first speaker. Uh, th uh, thank you very much, Saru. Um, uh, well, I, um, I, I, I think I'll start by saying I, I, I live in the United States. I work for a, a, a US-based group. And we're in the middle, as I think people are aware, of a big political campaign. And uh, uh, even though even though the pandemic treaty is not like a, a, a major pol political issue right now in the United States, I think that a lot of the misinformation about the negotiation that takes place is is one of the things that is it concerns us in terms of uh, because I, I I know from talking to delegates around the world that it's it's been an issue not just in the United States, but in other countries. And uh, uh, one, one thing that we'd always hoped uh, that, that the negotiations could be as transparent as possible. Much of, much of what takes place right now is uh, 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 really behind closed doors and it sort of feeds into some of the uh, conspiracy theories and misinformation that I think has been uh, not helpful for the reputation of the institution or the uh, or the, or the instrument itself. Uh, get, getting on to the to to to, to the instrument, you know, to the negotiation itself. I uh, it, it's obviously a really complicated uh, text, covering lots of different topics. And uh, I was asked to limit my remarks to initially just a couple of minutes, so I'm only going to talk about a few topics initially. One area that um, uh, we, we've uh, been really interested in ha have been on uh, the provisions in the treaty that deal with technology transfer. And by technology transfer, we think of that as including uh, the intellectual property rights that are associated with uh, inventions and materials and, and uh, um, uh, 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 just the, the growing sort of set of uh, ways that intellectual property is defined, including uh, rights to use regulatory tax data, uh, uh, but also uh, issue, issues relating to know-how to manufacture, access to biologic uh, resources. Um, I, and I did mention a regulatory pathway. So we have, uh, there's quite a few places in the agreement where these things come up. One of the areas of controversy that we have uh, briefed pretty extensively, and I think people have seen a lot of the, the documents we've written have to do with the language uh, the many references in the agreements to the, the words uh, mutually agreed upon terms. And uh, uh, when we began to sort of see this in, in the early drafts of the agreement, we uh, and a lot of other groups, we expressed concern that uh, the, 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 some of the ways that the agreement was written could be interpreted to actually limit the flexibility that countries have to take measures which are non-voluntary uh, to compel, require, to regulate, to sort of force companies to share technology in order to scale production or bring about uh, or expand access to lower cost versions of, of products. Um, at the same time as uh, the, 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 the treaty here was uh, ha have all these references to mutually agreed upon terms or voluntary measures, um, uh, the European Union was considering a regulation on pandemic response and emergencies that uh, went the other way and actually was very crystal clear that uh, the, the, the union could, could order there to be union-wide mandatory compulsory licenses when necessary and that that would extend to trade secrets uh, and any other um, 
um, you know, manufactured no know-how in a broad set of uh, what they would refer to as ancillary measures to, to allow, allow someone to to actually make a compulsory license on a patent, for example, um, a- actually um, implementable by by the, the party that was going on. So the, the EU was moving to strengthen and expand its powers to do compulsory licensing, not just of patents, but of know-how um, and uh, trade secrets and everything else. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, the U.S. government relied upon two parts of the U.S. law to really uh, use non-voluntary measures. One, they issued literally dozens of authorization and consent clauses in contracts that were signed by the U.S. government with uh, drug vaccine uh, manufacturers of other countermeasures. And these authorization and consent mechanisms were uh, done pursuant to a statute uh, in the United States on on government use of inventions that permit um, the U.S. government to authorize third parties to use any invention that was granted now or in the future, uh, 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 and 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 to and to do it in such a way that the company receiving the authorization uh, would not face an injunction or would not face damages. And the, the broad authorizations the U.S. did was implemented under a regulation in U.S. law. We have something called the, the Federal Acquisition Regulations. The FAR 52.2271 is the, is the uh, technical term for uh, the regulation. The regulation is an implementation of a different sta- of a of a statute 28 USC 1498 and the way that this this far this federal acquisition regulation works is if you reference in the contract that uh, far 52227-1 is included in the contract then the contractor which included companies like Moderna and a number of big big drug companies they would be authorized to, to use um, without <clears throat> without consent, without even notifying the patent owner, uh, any patent issued by the U.S. government or now or in the future. Now, the authorization was within the scope of the contract. It wasn't just for any purpose, but it was related to what was in the contract. And the U.S. government did this. Uh, we located, uh, you know, roughly almost 50 examples of where this was done in the context of COVID-19 and hundreds more that were done in the case of other situations, as many involving public health, but also many involving other, other activities where the U.S. government was using this authority. It was an ex- extraordinary um, uh, uh, example of state practice compared to other countries because it is so simple to use. It's so unconstrained in terms of the modalities. Like, for example, there's no restrictions on exports in the U.S. law, there's no requirement for prior negotiation. There's no requirement to even notify patent owners, and uh, it is uh, something that actually it, it makes a lot of sense in an emergency, even though it's available in non-emergency situations. So you had this example of, or this this context of the United States, uh, um, and oh, in addition to the, uh, the the law that dealt with the patents and the implementation of that through the um, the federal acquisition regulations. You also had in the United States, the Defense Production Act, which was used extensively during COVID-19, and which allows the United States to really take control of any production facility or direct the employees. U.S. was actually stationing um, uh, armed guards in, 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 in factories, military personnel. Uh, you had uh, uh, reports in the, in the British press that the U.K. was uh, considering um, under under uh, former Prime Minister uh, Johnson, they're considering uh, sending military personnel into the Netherlands to see certain things that they thought were relative to countermeasures. And uh, so when when we were switching back to the text of the pandemic treaty, you sort of see uh, countries willing to do all sorts of things that were clearly not you know not voluntary actions uh, in the course of a pandemic. Um, but, put, but insisting in, in all this language about mutually agreed upon terms and voluntary and things like that in, in the pandemic text. And it was uh, 
uh, there, there was a concern that it would result in a double standard that that uh, both the both the European Union negotiators and and member states in the European Union and the United States would concede that they thought that under their own national legal systems they were not limited to voluntary measures in the in the event of uh, an emergency or a pandemic and and uh, and and they thought nothing that they were negotiating the agreement was was really going to restrict them from um, uh, from from using non voluntary measures. So they said they wouldn't be they wouldn't sign it. They wouldn't join the agreement. But they really insisted the language be there. And I think our interpretation was that by having this language in the agreement, they were effectively trying to create a uh, an expectation that other countries, particularly uh, uh, weaker parties in, uh, in, the, in the global trading system or smaller countries or developing countries in particular or lower income countries would, would be, feel that the expectation was they could only use voluntary measures for technology transfer. Now, uh, when we began to pay more attention to this, we noticed that the voluntary mutually agreed upon terms Either, either the mutually agreed upon terms or the or the voluntary and mutually agreed upon terms, the different sort of ways it was expressed in the negotiation, had actually <clears throat> been uh, come up in other negotiations, in other other treaties, uh, and, uh, and, and it was sort of a, a growing thing. And so it, it looked like there was kind of a a, a corporate lobbying effort uh, by rights owners, particularly drug companies at some point to kind of push this language out uh, in different negotiations around the world. And that, and that uh, uh, there was a high level discussions in the White House in the United States or in the European Union to kind of put this into agreements to sort of, sort of make the technology transfer thing harder to do. And a lot of the emphasis in these and things were not so much on the patent side, but it was more on the know-how, um, uh, on the know-how side. Now, in the course of the, of the discussions, we, we, we felt there was then kind of a recognition by, by the European Union, some of its member states, by the UK, by the United States, uh, and other countries that, 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 that you know, that we, I think they, they recognized that that was kind of a, a legitimate concern that was being expressed. I know, and several countries in the negotiation had, 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 had raised this and had pursued this. And, and, and as well as the negotiations were taking place in, in New York at the time, uh, <clears throat> on a different uh, on a different uh, uh, resolution. So, one of the compromises that w was was proposed, which we thought was a reasonable compromise, was that if you were to make reference to mutually agreed upon terms in the context of technology transfer, that you would say uh, whenever you said that that it was without prejudice. You would say, uh, whenever you said that. To other measures that you may take, um, uh, uh, and so it was clear that even though you want people to promote, to enhance, to you know, to 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 make efforts to engage people in voluntary efforts, that did not mean that you were you were pro prohibit. You know, there was any barrier for you to do things that were inconsistent with that, as long as they kind of a, a you know. It was not like a, a waiver of other international rules. It was a it would be a statement that as long as you were playing by the rules that currently exist outside of this agreement, you could do things that were of a non-voluntary measures. And we're hopeful that in the agreement that either you don't make, which I think are these gratuitous references to voluntary uh, mutually agreed upon terms, or when you do, you make it crystal clear uh, that it's without prejudice to other measures that may, you may take that are necessary. And if you look at the, <clears throat> at the, uh, uh, the, you know, the proposed regulation in the European Union, I think they say very clearly that even though you want to use voluntary measures whenever possible, when they're not available or when they're not adequate, you don't want to restrict yourself. You want to have access to other, uh, 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 other things you can do. Now, um, I've, uh, given the fact that it's three speakers and it's a relatively short thing, I'm going to stop here, even though there's like other other topics that we're quite interested in. But I really wanted to uh, focus a bit on this topic of uh, uh, mutual agreed upon terms and and, and the, all the references to voluntary agreement. Uh, thank you, Thru. Thank you so much, Jamie. And just for everyone uh, to know, 
uh, our uh, Louise uh, has been able to join as well. And our next speaker will be um, Ellen Tehun from Medicines, Law and Policy. Thank you. Thank you, Thiru. Um, and um, well, thank you to my uh, two, two co-organizers for, for proposing this this session uh, gearing up for the um, for the for the next two weeks of, of negotiations. I want to make a, a few general comments and then turn to Article Eleven and make some specific comments in the few minutes that I that I have. Um, I, I I think the 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 MPOX outbreak is is a rel is is a relevant background to what's what's happening and a very clear illustration of why much stronger, much stronger international framework and much stronger um, obligations are, are needed. We see again a scrambling to get the get vaccines and countries are free to decide to donate vaccines that they have or not. My own country, uh, and, I'm, and I'm very ashamed about that, the Minister of Health has decided to not donate vaccines for use in Africa because she thinks they're more useful in the Netherlands. Now, aside from the fact that this is an illustration of the lack of understanding of disease, uh, the, the control of disease outbreak, um, the fact that that is even a possibility to refuse to share those vaccines with the, the countries and the people that, that need them is, of course, um, uh, I, I don't think we need an any, any more clear clearer illustration of why new obligations are are needed and a better international uh, international framework. Now, this the second more general comment I want to make. When I was when I was rereading the text, it struck me that um, it it it's sort of worded as if technology transfer and the sharing of 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 intellectual property, the licensing of intellectual property, is sort of something that happens outside the IP system. And I think it's very important to 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 recognize that. Um, technology transfer and the dissemination of technology is an explicit objective of the IP regime. So you could say failing to do so and failing to have mechanisms to ensure that it happens um, is actually a failure of the system um, it, itself. And it, it might be useful to reread Article 7 of the TRIPS agreement that describes it actually very, very clearly how um, uh, the, the, the transfer of technology is an explicit objective of the international uh, IP uh, IP regime. Now, I, I put the text of Article 11 on the slides. If I can share my screen, um, I don't. Yeah, I try. It, it, do you I see the it. share screen? Yeah, um, but it's disabled it, through post disabled oh, participant screen sharing. Let me uh, try to fix that. Can you try now? Let's try again. I think it works now. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, but that one we can skip. Um, I had fairly similar comments on, oh, I should say this is cut and paste from the document that went to the World Health Assembly, but the, the green and the yellow, the, the color coding did not copy paste with it, but there isn't a lot of green and yellow in Article 11. So um, for the for the original text, you have to refer to the to the World Health Assembly document A77 slash 10. Um, the, the, Jamie addressed the issue of voluntary, and I just want to make the point that in the midst of a serious health crisis, Voluntary may not always be the best option, and you may need to um, you may need to intervene as a government or as collective governments. Um, as, as Jamie pointed out, the European Commission um, understands that very clearly. If you look at the draft uh, regulation for EU-wide compulsory licensing, there is um, a, a clear recognition that compulsory licensing alone will likely not be enough when you need access to know-how, for example, and there are provisions to compel that access uh, access to know-how. So that is um, that is an, an important an important point. I I I'm also of the view that the the term voluntary and mutually agreed terms is really overdosed throughout throughout the text. 
Um, you want to know? It would be helpful if everyone muted because okay. I get a lot of background noise. I think I'm talking to you, Joel. Um, so um, I, I will not repeat the points that, that 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 Jamie made, but that is definitely something to um, to address in the uh, in in the coming negotiations. The other point I would like to make on this article is that I think it would be very helpful to have an explicit provision for publicly funded or gov and government funded um, in innovations, and um, because there is there is a difference in dealing with technologies. That the that governments fund where you can hold much more control over those innovations. And that is important to make some of the provisions further down in the tax uh, successful because that is where that is where the leverage is. And we've seen with COVID, vast amounts of money were spent on the development of vaccines, for example, but that leverage was not used to ensure the sharing of the know-how that was created with that uh, with that financing. Um, I've already made a point on the technology transfer, which I, I wanted to uh, address on this slide. The same with voluntary and mutually, mutually agreed. Um, the uh, under, um, in, 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 in this particular text, again, there is talk of um, government um, government owned pandemic related technologies. And I would really urge you, and here I'm talking to those of you who get to rewrite some of this text in a couple of weeks, um, to, um, to change that to government publicly funded and government funded uh, technologies and innovations. Because in reality, governments own, do not necessarily own a lot of the technologies, even though they pay a lot for it. What the tax should do is encourage governments um, or create the, the agreement amongst governments that if public money is used for the development of, of knowledge and the development of new tools and new product, that that funding that is used as leverage for the encouragement of sharing of that, uh, of that knowledge and sharing of the, uh, of the products. So it's, it would that, that would work with government funded technologies, but government owned would limit the options that you um, that you have. Um, I have the problem that I've got a whole bar over. Can I get rid of that thing here? Hold on. No, I cannot. Um, yes, um, paragraph F is is a very important one, although the way it is phrased now, one has a hard time recognizing what it was actually meant to do. But this is this is the clause that should ensure that if their access to know-how is necessary to produce critically important products, that that access is there, that that know-how is shared. Again, this is the paragraph that actually says compulsory licensing alone will not do the job. You need to also have a mechanism to make sure that there is access to um, to the to the know-how. Uh, we have we've actually written quite a bit about this 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 issue that now looks as if it's a bit of an obscure an obscure topic. But we can share those those documents in the in the chat with you, and we've also proposed um, language uh, for it to to make sure that the paragraph. Is um, is is meaningful? Um, I believe. No, I have not come to the to the end. I I have, don't have access to my. Oh, I'm I'm thirty seconds over my time. I'm going to take another thirty. That's seconds. okay. That's okay. Yeah. All right. Um, the uh, it's it's very important that this agreement creates new obligations. Cementing the status quo is really not helpful. It's actually almost equivalent to not having an agreement at all. So the move towards adopting previously agreed language is not terribly helpful because that previously agreed language has been around for a while and hasn't helped in a great deal. And here I want to draw attention to, um, to, to, to uh, 11.4, uh, which 
this is very familiar language, reiterate, uh, reaffirm the, that countries can use the flexibilities of the TRIPS agreement and the Doha Declaration, that we have seen numerous times in a, in a, in, in a large number of, of World Health Assembly and, and United Nations resolutions. But what is new and, and would change the status quo is the last sentence which I have underlined here, that the parties to this agreement will respect the use of these TRIPS flexibilities and, and it's still square bracketed, shall not exercise any direct and indirect pressure to that effect to, to discourage the, the use of such flexibility. That would be a very important, uh, important clause to have and would sort of change the, the status quo uh, somewhat. And I believe, um, of course, that there is there's a there's a lot more to to, to say, but I I'm I'm running out of time. Uh, but I want to to reiterate again that if you want pooling of IP to work, you need to link that to there where the leverage is to encourage those that hold the IP to actually engage with these ent entities, whether that is the medicines patent pool or the pandemic. Um, uh, the, the pandemic uh, pool or whatever is going to be created. It's important to learn the lessons from CTAP, the COVID-19 technology access pool. There it has been licensing to that pool of intellectual property, but it has almost been exclusively from government institutions. So that tells, that tells you something. But the private entity that held IP, for example, uh, the IP related to, to vaccines, refuse to engage with that. So it is important to have this paragraph, but there needs to be a linkage with those obligations of countries to make sure that the, that, that pool can indeed, can indeed function and that those that hold the IP uh, engage, uh, engage with it. Um, and, um, and it won't surprise anyone if I say that uh, paragraph six, uh, that which which talks about the national implementation of these trips flexibilities and and measures that you can use, um, including in in crisis or pandemic situations. That that is very very important. We often see countries have needlessly complex procedures, and here um, again, what J Jamie described a little bit how the United U.S. government has dealt with it. There's a lot of lessons to be learned from that. And with that, I hand back uh, to you, Thiru. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ellen. And uh, without further ado, uh, uh, we, we'll uh, now turn the floor to Luis. Uh, go ahead, please, Luis. And yes, are the, those are your uh, slides. Yes, well, uh, thank, you. It, thank you very much, uh, Thiru. Uh, Do you want them to put it in, um, um, sorry, in uh, slide, in, Display format, or I'm forgetting what it's called. But uh, oh, okay. I'll I'll try to do so. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> I think that that's it. Okay. Well, uh, after you know uh, listening to 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 James uh, and and Ellen, is uh, I mean, all all the the, the major points uh, have been you know already uh, addressed and. So I will, you know, focus on on, on some uh, additional uh, ones. Uh, but notwithstanding, I would like to stress uh, the importance uh, of each of the points that they have made. Um, and and to 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 do so, I would like to to, to start stressing why it's, it's so important uh, technology transfer uh, to to be a, a strong and and robust. Uh, part of the, the pandemic treaty. And as uh, many of you know, it takes transfer is essential if we want to uh, scale up production, if we want to, 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 to have a local production capabilities and to reduce supply chain bottlenecks um, and uh, no less important to increase uh, affordability of the, the health products that, that we need. And, and on also to enhance rapid response uh, in case uh, of uh, of need. So tech transfer is is really important. And as already been said, but Ellen, you know, the, the a key component of uh, 
tech transfer in, in, in the heart is intellectual property. And we have to, to, to have that very clear also addressed in the treaty. Uh, and, and, and the first thing that is very uh, uh, frustrating is that the tech transfer provision in Article 11 are, you know, mostly, uh, not to say uh, all, they are meant to be uh, voluntary and they are not a, a special provision uh, addressing the, uh, the need to, to have some mandated tech transfer. And, and why we need to have mandated tech transfer to, to, to really respond is that uh, experience uh, that we saw, saw in, in during the COVID pandemic is that uh, uh, many times tech holders uh, uh, were not willing to uh, engage in voluntary licensing. And the best examples are, you know, the, the, the failure of uh, CTAP that it was not able to, 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 to get uh, the licenses that, that were more critical. Um, also, uh, even if uh, the, the 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 tech holder are ready to 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 do voluntary uh, license, uh, the process of uh, of the negotiation of a tech transfer agreement it 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 can be very long, so it it's, will will not be efficient in the case uh, in some cases during a pandemic. So 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 there is very important that we are able to. To, to address uh, that uh, that missing part is that we, we have to come to 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 some provision that uh, define in which cases that there should be uh, some mandates uh, to uh, transfer. Also, uh, as uh, been mentioned, uh, we see that is uh, uh, very important to 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 solve the issue that there is uh, the the there are not commitments uh, or not conditions. Uh, for uh, for the transfer of uh, government uh, funded uh, technologies, only there is a reference, as mentioned, Ellen, to uh, government owned, which is a subset uh, of those cases where the the, the technology has been funded uh, by public money. Also, we we, we don't see any concrete man, uh, uh, incentive for uh, technology transfer. Uh, I mean, voluntary licensing, and. Also, something that uh, we see that is uh, very important to, to solve is the, that there is not a, a monitoring system or, uh, or, or, or a way to, to uh, advance a, a, a technology transfer uh, when this is uh, not happening and that technology transfer is needed. You know, in, in the case that uh, we, we can imagine a, a, a company that uh, Will be able to 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 produce a, a given technology that is needed, and they request the the the, the, the voluntary licensing. And this is not uh, working. Then, uh, what is the resource? Uh, we, we we had a a, a case when the, the COVID pandemic when a Canadian company tried to to get a license to 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 produce uh, a vaccine, a Johnson and Johnson vaccine, and it was not uh, able to to come to, to to a license and, and also it was not able to, to, to go through a compulsory licensing and, and there was no uh, place where to, to put a complaint or, or to to find a solution. And uh, also we see that uh, they, they, they are not specified uh, uh, elements that uh, should clarify how, how how much should be the the, the royalties in a case of a voluntary licensing uh, needed uh, in case of a pandemic. So uh, going to uh, specifically to the uh, to the text uh, in Article Eleven, and we we, we see that will be important uh, to add within the, the Article Eleven Number One uh, A. To, to in, include a reference to, to the, the use of front terms in, in case of a, a pandemic has been declared, because uh, we, we see in a other instrument that relates to a technology transfer uh, that they are referenced to uh, uh, whether there are reasonable uh, conditions 
or even a FRAN, which means a fair and reasonable and non-discriminatory terms. We think that uh, addition will, will be very useful. Uh, also, we uh, to, to solve the issue of that there is not a, uh, uh, some uh, guidance on wh when there, is, there should be uh, a, a mandate of transfer of technology of government uh, public uh, funded, we, we, we propose that uh, once the WHO has officially declared there is an urgent need for a specific technology, then that will, will trigger the obligation of having uh, those uh, technologies uh, uh, that have been publicly funded uh, to be licens licensed in FRAN terms. Uh, to, to add, as, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the other international agreements uh, that refers to, to the need of a tech transfer, they uh, incorporate uh, especially this point. And you, you can see that in, in the Convention of Biological Diversity in Article 16, uh, also in, in the PIP framework and the tobacco control uh, on the International Treaty on Plant Generic Resources and Food and Agriculture, you know, Article 13, uh, there is a reference uh, on those terms and same in the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea uh, with regard to technology transfer. Uh, other points uh, that uh, we, we would like to stress that have been already uh, mentioned by, by, by Ellen and are the, the, the need to, uh, to expressly mention the need of uh, update on reviewing the the IP laws uh, with regard to the use of flexibilities, uh, because as we, we have seen, uh, most countries, uh, excluding the United States uh, and, and now in, in, in Europe, uh, don't have clear uh, and easy to uh, implement uh, government use uh, provisions uh, in case of, uh, of needing uh, to, to use a technology that is not being uh, licensed uh, voluntarily, you know, you know, a, a case in a case in point, for example, in 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 Chile or Peru here in, in Latin America don't have these uh, provisions, and in the case of Chile, when uh, this topic has been taken to the Congress, uh, it just doesn't move because there is not a, a political interest on engaging in this complex topic. So, if we, there is a mandate. Uh, of reviewing, then that will uh, make easy the, uh, the, the, the process of advancing these, uh, these reforms. Uh, I'm, I'm over my time, Dennis, uh, Thiru? Um, no, just a few minutes. We just, of course, just want to, uh, you know, after you your um, remarks, uh, we will we'll open the okay. floor, but um, just uh, one yeah, okay. or two minutes. Yeah, yes. So, uh, 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 I'm, 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 Coming to my end, so and the, there is other uh, the, 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 there is other specific suggestion in in, in Article Eleven Five. Uh, we think that is is very important to include here uh, the, the the capabilities or or the, or the mandate to WHO to uh, monitor uh, whether the, the tech transfer is is happening or not happening, and and to to be able to to. To, to, to be a, a, a place where uh, the, the, the tech transfer uh, is, you know, informed to the conference of the of the party if it's working or not and what measure to be uh, taken. Uh, so we, we, we propose to, to the, 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 the treaty in, include a reference to a monitoring technology transfer uh, unit uh, to, to work on this. And I, I will stop here uh, to, to leave time for the discussion. Well, thank you so much, Louise, and uh, also to our uh, pre presenters, uh, um, including Ellen Tahoon and Jamie Love. Uh, one comment that I saw, of, um, um, and Lu Louise, you can uh, unshare your screen uh, when you can, okay. was that uh, for those of you who had presentations, uh, whether you could uh, share your slides, please. Uh, one, one of our participants requested yes. this, and, uh, and and now uh, we'd like to 
open the floor for discussion. Uh, and of course, the experts can intervene now too. But if uh, I see any raised hands in the um, in the chat, please raise your hands using the chat function as well. But uh, Jamie, you want to go? Yeah. <clears throat> One thing I wanted to talk about is, um, um, I mean, the, the, the treaty as it written it leaves a lot of the. A lot will depend on the implementation of the, of the provisions. Uh, th there's a lot of parts of it have to do with promote uh, uh, within the national law, or there's like a lot of a lot of uh, caveats and things that kind of make it so th there are provisions that are either not spelled out what the exact obligations are yet, and norms that might be developed later. There's provisions in the agreement where you can adopt amendments or protocols or a sort of a sort of other measures um, uh, in the implementation phase that will put more concrete uh, structure to what, what some of the higher level things in the in the earlier parts of the text are. So um, it, it, part of it will depend upon whether or not countries really f f find find the agreement in, in their interest to actually implement in a useful way. We've we've been kind of, we've been very keen on the idea that there be voluntary agree, um, clubs that can be created by countries that want to do things in technology transfer. Uh, uh, you, you can imagine a pooling mechanism, or we uh, we, we certainly have been in favor of a pooling mechanism for technology transfer, where countries would agree to share rights on government funded technology with members of a pool that would not necessarily extend the same benefits to parties outside the pool and that there would be obligations to join the pool, which would be attractive to the people that were make, uh, contributing technology to the pool. Uh, and uh, also that there may be a mechanism to collaborate and with, with people to buy technology for money from people that own technology that were, for example, in the private sector that didn't want to donate it uh, for the benefit of the people that were cooperating and aggregating their, their buying power to buy the technology. These are things that are technically, you know, I mean, they're not, not, not just technically, they're voluntary. Uh, uh, and they seem to be in the spirit of what a lot of people are asking, but they, they, they would also kind of address in some ways the problem you have of the unwillingness of people to contribute uh, what they have to everyone without getting anything in return. It's sort of, if you don't give, you don't get, philosophy. It's not ideal in the sense that ideally you'd want people to really make everything a global public good. But uh, it, it, there are some some limits to how far that will go for people that have um, assets that, they, that people want access to. And, and one thing that we think is in the text right now, uh, in the technology transfer thing, is the possibility of pursuing those kind of uh, th those kind of co collaborative agreements, but that will depend upon leadership and um, and willingness and 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 by some of the major uh, uh, stakeholders to uh, a, in terms of national government. I mean, uh, not so much stakeholders, but some of the na uh, some some countries to sort of support it and move that forward. Uh, and I, I didn't get a chance to talk about that before, but I wanted to just briefly mention that. Thanks, Jamie. I see we have a question from Andreas Wolf. Uh, Andreas, please go ahead or a comment. Yeah, thank you. It's a, it's a question, actually, and, and also a comment. That um, I, I really wonder what to make out of this uh, big announcements and, and work of um, the BioNTech uh, companies um, in, in Germany who started to, to put their, their, um, their containers production containers into Rwanda. You will have heard about this. And it, it, it is very much uh, promoted also by the German Ministry of, of, uh, of uh, uh, Cooperation as one model of, of uh, technology transfer after they um, so after they, they were so much criticized for not sharing um, sharing the, the COVID-19 vaccines. So they, they somehow extend that it's not so clear to us, to what extent this is really tech, tech transfer, or is it just shipping over a part of their own production side while holding uh, all the knowledge and all the, um, the, the IP 
uh, into their own hands. Can you, are you familiar with it? Can you comment on this, how we might also should move forward in, in uh, reacting to this? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Agus. Okay. But, but, but if, if other, others want to respond first. Uh... Ellen, Luis, would you like to respond? Well, and... well just to say, I haven't, I haven't followed this recently, but I do know that a number of these initiatives um, have been abandoned in the, in the meantime. So there have been huge okay. announcements, but in, in reality, how much has actually happened, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not entirely clear about that. Um, Wemos, I don't know whether there's any, anyone from Wemos on this call, but Wemos has recently, um, or recently was before the summer, I believe, um, published a, um, a, a report on these, on these initiatives, if my memory is correct, but I can, I can dig that out and, and share it with, um, no. uh, with all of you. Yeah. No, it's true, but yeah. Yeah, we have it. But but of course, I mean, your 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 point is, what does technology transfer actually mean? You know, if you sort of contract manufacturing, which we've also seen during COVID, is not the same as technology transfer, where you actually share the knowledge and the know-how and the show the show how you will there will have to be a, you know an intense collaboration to make that to make that happen. Um, and that is that is the kind of uh, the kind of technology transfer that we're talking about. The the other more general point I wanted to make is that that needs to happen in between pandemics because the the building of the of the capacity, of course, also depends on the sharing and the dissemination of technology. And if you wait every time until the pandemic hits, that is perhaps not the best time to do this. Um, so there will you will have to have activity. Uh, in, in between the, the, the pandemics. And there is, of course, now a, a huge emphasis on, on greater self-reliance, on greater re regional geographical spread of production capacity, for example. And that would hopefully lead to, um, uh, to more, in, more intense um, sharing of the, uh, the know-how. That may bring benefits also beyond pandemics, of course. Can, can, can I, I just say uh, uh, br br briefly on the, this question of, the, uh, the, you know, like the biotech thing with Rwanda or, or you know, you hear, you hear a couple of d different things. Uh, the, the companies have uh, sometimes in their self-interest, they want to outsource some some part of their production or they may want to control in some ways, uh, uh, have some control over what someone who's making a, a version of their product is doing or is in their sort of competitive space. So, uh, you know, it, it, it may be fine. I mean, uh, sometimes it's really useful for, for scaling, but do, do, do you want to depend upon, solely depend upon what, what the companies that, that decide to do? Because the, the bigger question is, is, is what they're doing, achieving the scale of response that you think is appropriate and, and you know, like how far are you from where you want to be? So they could do a, a couple of things, but maybe what you need is a lot more. And, and so does, does the agreement totally leaving things up to their large ass get you where you have to go uh, or not? I, I think that uh, too little attention has been made in the negotiations on the incentives um, and, the, and the economics about making technology transfer happen. Um, and it's, you know, it's a big argument about whether or not you can force people to do it or whether you can, uh, whether they'll do it voluntarily or whether the, the law, or the trips allows it or not, things like that. But it, it, at the end of the day, if you really want to scale things, I think you have to, you have to also uh, look at the financial incentives people have or go governments have, the, the incentives they have to cooperate or not cooperate. And do they, are there some reasons why they, they, they don't want to cooperate or they don't want to give that you can solve within the context of a cooperative agreement? So you want to sort of get the people that want the technology better organized to deal with the people that have the technology or to cooperate or to share with each other in a way that they find is uh, make, making everybody uh, in, in, that, in that group uh, better off that's willing to step up. But... Uh, I, 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 I think what you don't want to do 
is go through this whole exercise and say, at the end of the day, we'll just sort of take whatever the companies decide to throw, you know, like, like to do. And, 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 and governments are no longer making decisions. It's all really basic, you know, up to whatever bio or pharma wants to do. Sorry. Thanks, Jamie. I'll collect two questions because our time is short. So the first question I see is a, a written question from Preeti Patnaik. Um, go back. Go back. Your, just, go, go no, back. No, I'm reading in the order it was presented. Yeah, sorry. Uh, um, what are your views on incorporating technology transfer provisions as an intended benefit in the PEP system? And actually, now I uh, will turn over to Gopa so you can ask your question or your comment uh, so we can collect uh, and then you can decide among yourselves uh, how to answer. Gopa, go ahead. Gopa, you're, you're muted. Gopa? We see him, but now we need to hear. <laughs> well, uh, uh, should, should we should we respond to Pretty's question? Yes. On, on, on the PAMS, There's, I'll let others go first. Luis, do you want to answer? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I I have a, a, a short answer. I I think that uh, tech transfer is, is extremely critical, and we, we need to 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 put as much incentives and mandates uh, to it. So we, we, we believe that the PAP system uh, and also it should incorporate you know, specific tech transfer provision that are referred to, to, to it. But uh, tech transfer is, uh, is a bigger, uh, and, and it, it's, it's, it go beyond what can be happening in, in, in PAPs. Uh, we, we think that it applies in, in, in in many a situation where the, the PAPs uh, might not uh, apply. So uh, we think the general principle uh, and, and should be uh, outside uh, PAPs and have uh, strong provisions uh, by itself. Thank you very much, uh, Luis. Uh, Gopa, and do you want to mute, please? You're still yeah. muted. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, no, uh, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Uh, uh, there was, sorry, uh, there was some problem with my mic earlier. <clears throat> I think the uh, pandemic um, uh, treaty negotiations uh, related to tech transfer, I think, based on two assumptions, uh, which basically lead to the very um, uh, skewed way of looking at the whole issue of uh, tech transfer. The first assumption is that uh, there is no capacity existing uh, in, uh, you know, in the develop, especially in the developing countries, but uh, it's a fact that there are um, manufacturers, there are different levels of capacities are existing in different parts of the country. So the uh, tech transfer provisions, uh, uh, basically, you don't have to do the hand to hand uh, or, or, you know, full spectrum tech transfer. You don't have to haul, uh, you know, from the beginning to the end. So that's a, 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 the first assumption. And that first assumption basically leading uh, to the second assumption is that you cannot carry out tech transfer without the cooperation of the technology holder so the technology holder that's why the whole mutually and voluntarily agreed terms uh, comes into play uh, but there are ways and means in which uh, tech transfer can carry out so the most important missing element here is that uh, uh, as I told, there are capacities existing, but they they also require some information uh, to be supplied. So that information can be even provided without the cooperation of the uh, technology holder. So here the role of WHO. So WHO has no role in the tech transfer is uh, uh, provisions are concerned. So that needs to be relooked into, and WHO uh, traditionally carry out certain tech transfer activities through international pharmacopoeia for instance or uh, or uh, vaccine standardization uh, processes or even they do have even cell reference libraries so all these provisions uh, all these existing programs of who needs a reference in the tech transfer provisions when if we look at the uh, uh, 
uh, international pharmacopoeia. Uh, during the COVID times, even they developed the uh, sort of, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, what is it called uh, uh, for the remdesivir. Uh, they have uh, provided, uh, they have provided the uh, proposal to include in the international pharmacopoeia. And, and another, uh, a few more medicines which identified for uh, COVID also included. Uh, so therefore, the, there should be a legal obligation on WHO to contribute to these activities. Otherwise, uh, it will be treated only as a program and then there is no accountability or there is no speed in which they can do. They can incorporate a medicine which is meant for um, a pandemic can be five years later. But if there is a legal obligation on WHO to include and start working on uh, to develop a, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, develop a portfolio of pandemic products to be included in the uh, international pharmacopoeia at the earliest, then um, that will speed up. So there are capacities existing. Those countries can look at the international pharmacopoeia entry of a pandemic related health products and uh, develop their own without the help of the uh, technology holders. So that element is missing. So I would like to point out that. Thanks. Thank you, Gopa. We have a, another written question from Professor Jeremy Tabir. Um, I can read it out, but it's uh, quite a long one. Um, so Jeremy, if you wanna um, just ask the question directly, please go ahead. Or if not, I, I can read it out and, uh, uh, and then our participants uh, can answer. Um, Thanks, dear. My question is where all this is going and uh, whether we might've been better off with uh, no agreement instead of whatever we're likely to get. Uh, at the end of all this. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to take that through if you're, um, and, and I should probably preface my comment with I'm, a, I'm, a, um, I'm an optimist by, uh, by nature. I, I, I do think, uh, though let me start by saying I, the, the slides I posted have a last slide, which I didn't show, which is a sh summary of a paper that we did at the very early days of this process. And it, it sort of shows the, the enormous optimism we, we, we had um, uh, as to what this disagreement uh, should be doing with regard to intellectual property and tech, tech transfer. It, fo it focused on that, but it's, um, it, it's, it's interesting to, to reread that paper now two years into the, uh, into the negotiations. The text that's now before us is, um, you know, is 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 very far from that um, from that wishful thinking, but I still think that it is more worthwhile to have this agreement than to not have the agreement for a couple of reasons. First of all, it does flag all the the key uh, all the key issues. Um, also, the agreement is not necessarily set in stone when it's, and first of all, we don't know what the outcome is going to be. I also hope that some improvements are, are, are possible. And I also hope that it will be, will be structured in such a way that um, amendments are, 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 are possible or additional protocols will be, po will be possible so that at the, at the stage of the regular review of, of the agreement, there is, uh, there is room for, uh, for improvement. So also for that, it would be, uh, would be important. Having said that, uh, that, that would require making sure that the sort of more, more harmful texts that take or potentially take away um, the policy space that countries have, um, have today and for example, this, this, this issue about what, what I call the overdosing of the term voluntary, um, that would have to be, uh, I hope that that will be, be cleaned up because that could actually be, um, be a step backwards instead of, of, of forward. So overall, I think it is more important to have this agreement than to not have it uh, at all, uh, assuming that also further review and revisions will be possible in the future. Over. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, Louise has a question, and then uh, as the time is getting short, uh, we'll give our last can, question can, 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 over to uh, um, can, can I respond also to Jeremy's thing? Yes. I, I don't mind waiting for Louise, but I, 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 I yes. think. No, uh, yeah. James, you want to go first? Go first. OK, all right. Uh, so I'm going to, can I still share the screen? I, I think, um, yeah, share the screen. 
Um, let's see to uh, uh, let's see which way is it here. Um, yeah. So uh, can you see this? Um, these are. Uh, 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 are, 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 um, are you able to? Yeah, we can see the articles. Uh, oh, okay. okay. I, I, I'm sorry, but I don't, didn't know how the technology is working. So on what Ellen said, and I made a reference to this earlier, um, uh, what one thing that you, you I mean, I, I have to go back and look to see where the current status, this was based on the May 10th text, we made these observations that, uh, uh, that it's pretty flexible in terms of like getting into the agreement because you can make reservations. Uh, th there's ways that you can do amendments, annexes, and protocols. And uh, so during the implementation, if the ambitions were kind of limited at this point, because you think that uh, it's hard to get consensus and you had to kind of weaken things down to kind of get people to agree to things and you know, there was just, just people were dividing a lot of stuff. Over time, if you have good faith on the implementation, it seems like you could actually make the thing uh, uh, more binding where it's currently weaker, or you could have more concrete implementation things that have to do with building cooperative measures or best practices on regulatory policies and things like that. I think that uh, uh, the issue of should it be a treaty or should it be uh, something that's a, 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 like a non-treaty instrument, like the PIP framework's not a treaty, for example. Um, I, I don't think people should be hung up on making it be a treaty myself because uh, I've been through treaty ratification processes and they take a long time and they're, they're difficult and challenging in a lot of countries. I think what's important is do people find the norms that are set out in the agreement and the mechanisms for cooperating uh, uh, to be in their interest, uh, to be things that make them better off and safer. And uh, so I think that the nature of the instrument, I, 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 would, I would encourage people to be a little bit more open-minded about, about whether it's a treaty or something else. And then to pay attention to the fact that the real work probably is gonna take place after the agreement, you know, if, it, if, if they get an agreement, after the agreement comes about. Uh, and that these articles 27, 29, 30, and 30, and 31 are going to be pretty important. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Louise, uh, we'll yes, have your response, and then we'll go to Lynette's question, and then we'll. Yes, no, no. Uh, very briefly, was to, to agree with Gopa and, and that uh, we need to have uh, more clear uh, mandates to WHO to, to address. Uh, technology transfer uh, failures. And so it's, 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 I think it's, it's easier, uh, you know, to, 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 to include mandates of technology transfer once uh, it's, it's more uh, reduced or specific what type and in which cases the, the a given technology shall be transferred and uh, not, not a, like really broad uh, obligation to, to, to transfer of technology in you know, or any sort of technology. And WHO uh, could be very uh, useful in identifying which specific technology within a, a, a pandemic is, uh, should uh, be uh, a mandated transfer, you know, which will trigger the mandate of, of transfer. Uh, but, and on, on, the, on the question on, you know, whether, you know, it's better or not to have, you know, this instrument as it's going, uh, I think that uh, in addition uh, to what Helen and, and James has mentioned, uh, I, I think that the, the, the instrument as it is has uh, not addressed the tech transfer that we really need, uh, but there are other uh, 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 good things coming out of it uh, as uh, the, uh, is, is an orientation uh, uh, or, or highlighting the needs that countries uh, should be done on even on their own. Uh, which sometimes is missing, you know, a, a, a policy in, in in the country, sometimes they don't address health as it, they should, or, or they don't care ab uh, much ab about local production, uh, for example. So so the instrument, even if it's not exactly what we, we, we need, it has some good things that uh, are worth, you know, having. 
Thanks, uh, Luis. And um, uh, we're, we're just about to wrap up, but just I'll read out um, Lynette uh, Mabute's uh, 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 question. Basically, uh, she asked if, in a way, can the, um, here, sorry, I'm trying to pull up the question, but uh, she asked if, she asks if the current um, MPOX outbreak can be considered a litmus test on whether the draft agreement is fit for purpose and could this inform what is needed to amend uh, provisions within the pandemic agreement. And with that, uh, like after your answers, we could, can- could, uh, could, 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 could you repeat that? Well, basically, could the current uh, MPOX outbreak be a litmus test uh, to sort of see where, you know, how responsive the pandemic agreement is to, you know, a new outbreak and what would be, would one amend? Uh, well, I, I, yeah, I mean, I'm mean, sure the, the MPOX thing sort of gets people head around a more concrete example. You know, I, I think one of the, one of the challenges people have in the negotiations is like, like what's covered, like, you know, what, what's going to consider to be a pandemic under the treaty? Like what's, what are the range of things that are take place? Because, when they were negotiating, COVID-19 was really, you know, what everyone was like thinking about. But then uh, the, um, the, you know, the monkeypox uh, pandemic is very, very, very different. And, and uh, the Zika outbreak was, I mean, all these things are really not the same. And that's one of the challenges of the agreement is because what you might want to do when a, uh, like a massive uh, um pandemic like like COVID may not be the same thing you'd want to do in a for Ebola, for example. So um, uh, the, the, the danger is you look at one particular outbreak and you sort of think that's the model for all outbreaks because it's, it's really not. Thanks, Jamie. And uh, I think we can wrap it up. But any uh, closing words from either of our panels? I'll just interject just to remind um, um, our participants that um, next week, the 11th session of the INB, the Intergovernmental Neg Negotiating Body, will meet from the 9th to the 20th of September. And the Secretary has published a number of documents, including the schedule, and more or less the item which we've been, uh, has been the subject of discussion today, Article 11, is due to be discussed on Monday, um, the uh, 16th of uh, September. Um, but yeah, over to uh, the panel. Are we supposed Is to have any final, final <laughs> words? Otherwise, we can um, close it and. Uh... Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think that. Uh, People are like some talk about whether or not they, they have to meet a particular deadline in, in reaching an agreement. And uh, well, particularly if you think of this as like a treaty, which is a really uh, hard thing to get uh, and, and takes a long time to get implemented. I would not think it's it's a huge rush. I think it's it, it's no big deal if the if negotiations drag on for a while. If it if it's not really good enough, if you know if you if you think you can you can you can you can improve improve and you know raising ambitions and things like that. I, I I don't see any big thing in the the timetable. I think for a lot of the negotiators, they they have a lot of ownership over the process and they want to close it down while they're while they're in the driver's seat. And I kind of understand that, but they're, 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 you should make sure that you don't make things worse off when, when you negotiate the text. Like you know, a lot of our concern on the mutually agreed upon terms and things like that is we don't want to set a norm that like, if you have a global emergency, you can't do anything that's not voluntary. I mean, uh, that, that'd just be crazy. Uh, and, and, and yet there's a strong industry lobbying on topics like that to get end up with something that's actually kind of worse off. The other thing is that the PABs, the, uh, we didn't really talk about it. Uh, in this particular call, because I, you know, I, I think it kind of people wanted to focus on other topics, but uh, it's just our view uh, at, at KI that a lot of the equity issues that are associated with the PABs are, are, are we, we would prefer that the equity issues are dealt with in other parts of the agreement because we don't want 
the equity uh, provisions, and, and they are, I mean, they're th throughout the agreement, but we don't want equity to depend upon a voluntary contract between a company um, uh, and a database. Uh, we, we would like, uh, if, if you think there's measures that need to be taken to promote equity and access, technology transfer and affordable products, we don't want them to depend upon uh, 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 like a Pitts framework kind of a deal. Um, that said, it, you know, obviously if, if, if the PABS is implemented, it will have some value and you can expect something to return for participation. But I think that there has to be some realism about uh, to what extent other equity demands can be tied to that and whether or not they're better off in other parts of the agreement. Thank you, Jamie. And on that note, I'd like to thank all our speakers and our participants for um, attending this event, and we look forward to seeing some of you in person in the coming weeks. So thank you all. Take care.